also know that I always have ground rules I set when I preach, right? If it's funny, you can laugh. If it's not funny, but you think it is, go ahead and laugh. I won't be offended, right? Also, phones, please turn them to stun. I don't want to hear them. It's very distracting to everybody else around you when they go off, as well as it's distracting to me. And I get distracted enough when I look in the back alcove back there and see my wife back there. I forget what I'm saying, what I'm doing. 25 years later, and she still does that to me. Okay? So I try not to look back there. Okay? The other rule I always have is, please do not fall asleep, because I can throw a shoe far enough in this room to hit anybody in this room if you fall asleep. We're going to change that rule today. Okay? And here's why. Today, during the sermon, I want you to just relax. I want you to be comfortable. We're in God's house. Pick a lounge chair and just relax. Spend some time with our Father. Right? I want you to not only hear the words I say today, I want you to smell those words in your mind. I want you to visually see everything I'm explaining to you today. I want you to feel it. I want you to touch it. And the only way you can do that is to have your mind relaxed and let your mind explore the things we're talking about today. Now with that, if you fall asleep, that's on you. You're going to miss a wonderful sermon today, I hope. But you're going to miss wonderful words from God. And if you choose to miss that, that's on you. I'm not going to change that. So if you feel yourself nodding off, please don't snore because you may get a shoe, but otherwise, it's on you. We just celebrated Easter, and I don't know if you guys were like me, but I was so impressed, Dennis, with the program for Easter. The sermon, the music, everything was just so perfect, and what we needed to hear for Easter. Wonderful job. That was fantastic. It's probably one of the best Sabbaths I've had around here in a long, long time. And we celebrated the rise of our Savior, risen from the dead, for us, right? Isn't that something to be excited about? Hey, man, thank you. Everybody's excited about that. We should be. But we learned just two weeks prior to that from Jack that when you're dead, you're not dead, you're sleeping. And when your eyes pop open again, the next thing you're going to see is Jesus coming for you. Amen? That's exciting too. And Jesus died, but he was only asleep. Right? And he was just waiting for his renewal to come back. And that's why I like this time of the year. I like the springtime. Jesus renewing up out of the ground to come back. Like he said he would for us. Everything this time of the year is just so fantastic. It's a renewal this time of the year, isn't it? A renewal of the earth, a rebirth. Everything's starting to come back to life. It should always remind us of Easter and Jesus and what he did for us. Now, many of you know we have a little farm that my wife and I bought here a few years ago, and we call it Butterfly Acres. It's not acres, it's an acre and a half, but it's more than one, so we can call it acres, okay? (laughs) Don't argue with me. And I love this time out at our little farm, because all that dead brown grass starts getting irrigated again, and it starts coming back. And if you've ever seen photos of my backyard with my turkeys, I think I had some up here in my last sermon I did, my turkeys out in the beautiful green back lawn, that's my back pasture area. It can get like a golf course back there, just wonderful, thick Bermuda grass. It's, it's wonderful, and I love that green. I love the feeling. It's cool even. Well, on a hot day, that grass just puts up the coolness, and I love it. All of my dead brown trees start budding out again. Different shades of green from the different trees, from the willows to the desert willows to the cottonwoods to the mulberries, all start bringing their leaves back in just a vibrant of green colors. And some of those trees have the most incredible blossoms. I can't think of the name of the tree now. My wife probably remembers. But they have the big, beautiful white flowers. 
No. I can't think of what they're called, but they're from the Northeast, but they have big, beautiful white flowers. Huge. The bloom on them. And I love that. I love that feeling of life and renewal. And then we have a small orchard we planted. And I love the orchard because the apricots and the peaches start blooming at about the same time, pretty early in the spring. The apricots with their beautiful white flowers, with the little reds on the inside, and the beautiful pink flowers of the peach trees. Just beautiful and fragrant, aromic. And those are followed up then by our cherry trees. They start blooming. Our plums, they start blooming. Cherry blossoms are just fantastic. And then the apples begin to follow after that. And then the pears. And then after all these trees bloom and they start leafing out, then we watch as the fruit begins to grow. More life from the tree. Isn't that fantastic? Then we have an area we get the tractor out, we plow up for our garden every year. And we plow up all that fresh dirt and all that mulch that's been sitting there all winter long that we've piled on it from the fall of all of our old dead leaves and grasses and all kinds of good leftover kitchen goop we put out there. We start plowing that dirt up, and to me, there's nothing better than the smell of that good, enriched, mulchy dirt, especially when you get a little bit of water on it. I love that smell. I love irrigation days when I go out there and flood that area and just all that wonderful smell. I think it's wonderful. The worms like it because they're everywhere in my garden. And if the worms like it, it's okay by me. And then we start planting our seeds. We plant our green beans, and our peas, our beets, our radishes, our melons, our zucchinis. Oh, man, those zucchinis. Seems like no matter how many we plant, we always have too many, right? Our winter squashes, our pumpkins, our peppers, our tomatoes, and we watch them as they begin to grow and fill this garden. And it's spring, and it's beautiful, and it's new life, and you get to watch it, right? But there's other things I really like about springtime, too, and that's the babies. Oh, the babies. I love going out on hikes around Dead Horse State Park, and sometimes when you get out there, if you're in the early morning or early evening, you'll see the deer if you know where to look. Most people miss the deer. They're everywhere out there, but you've got to look for them. And the deer start having their fawns, these beautiful little, perfect little baby deer, right? And i got to tell you, javelina are the most ugliest creatures we have in the state, but a baby javelina, a baby javelina is the cutest little thing. If I could have baby javelinas, they would grow up, I would have them all over my place. Because they're the cutest little things in the world. And you see baby bobcats and baby coyotes when you're out hiking around. And, and you walk around the ponds and there's otters. And the otters have their little babies with them sometimes. If you get really lucky, you'll see that. And the beavers. And there's babies. And then you see the signs popping up all over the neighborhood. Free puppies to a good home. Free kitties to a good home. And little kitties and little puppies and a little puppy breath? Who doesn't like puppy breath? Right? It's beautiful. I love little puppy breath. I like the little needle teeth when they nibble on you. It hurts, but it's cute. But these babies, these perfect little babies and creatures... Well, I'm way ahead of my notes. That's pretty good. I don't have to look at it yet. I don't know where I'm at. But all that new life is fantastic. Now, maybe, just maybe, I've got babies on the brain. <laughs> Due to the fact that any day now, for the next few weeks, our grandson Dawson might be here. Our little miracle baby. And he's a miracle baby, not just to us, but to this whole church. Because this whole church has been praying for the health of Dawson. And we're there, folks. 
we're there. He's still giving his mom a few fits. We're not sure which way he's going to come yet. But he is coming. And he is healthy. So amen for that. And here's the thing. I'm not a first-time grandpa. But I'm just as excited as if I was. Right? I'm still just as excited. And to prepare for Dawson, I've got my tactical grandpa bag. Now, you think a tactical grandpa bag is cool, you ought to see the tactical daddy diaper bag that Jaden has. It's twice this size, and it's full of even more good stuff. Okay? But I'm prepared. I got my tactical grandpa patch. All right? That's pretty cool. And this one here, if you can't read it, says, this is what an awesome grandpa looks like. And I agree. I'm an awesome grandpa. Okay? And I've got my bottle ready to load up and go. I've got my burp rags ready to go. I've got diapers. I've got wipes. I've got all kinds of binkies. You see, the tactical diaper bag is cool because you've got all these carabiners on here to hang all your stuff from. I've got more binkies. I've got little animals on the binkies. We have something to play with while he's sucking his binky. I've got one on the back with a dinosaur on it. And I am loaded and I am ready to go. Dawson, I'm ready for you to come, buddy. Hurry up. We're ready now. You stalled long enough, which was good, but we're ready. So let me ask you this. Are you this prepared for Jesus to come? Do you have your bag ready? Do you have everything you need? As our scripture reading says, we got to become as those children. And I know, and you know I know, None of us are really there yet. We've still got a lot of work to do. So when Dawson is born, Dawson is going to have this brilliant ability to learn everything. His mind will be an open book. He hasn't learned anything yet. It's up to us to feed him. He will have untapped potential to learn about the love of God, discover God's many gifts for him, what God's got planned for him, and God obviously has plans for Dawson. He will have the capacity to love willingly, look past race or color. Have you ever seen kids in a schoolyard? We hear so much, again, and and I'm I'm not sure why our country seems to be going backwards sometimes, but we hear so much anymore about racism again. And, and there is some. We, we see it all on occasion. But I don't believe it's the levels that it used to be. But have you ever seen kids on a playground? There's no color in the kids. They could care less if you're blue. If you're a friend, you're a friend. They love you just the same. They hold cans just the same. I remember one time... When I used to drive trucks, this has been a long time ago. Driving through Chicago and out in the school ground in a low income area of Chicago where I happened to be delivering my goods, there was a little white boy and a little Afro American girl standing together holding hands out by the street in an area where there was probably some division. They don't care. They don't care. They just love. That's all they do. That's all they do. Dawson, every person he meets when he gets here is going to be a friend. Everyone. But Dawson, if you're not awake, have mama wake you up. I'm talking to you. Oh, he's awake? Oh, he's not? Wake him up. Because I need to apologize to Dawson. I need to apologize to Dawson for his parents. No, no. no not that they're going to be bad parents. Not that they're going to be bad parents. They're going to be great parents. That I guarantee you. They're going to be great parents. And they're going to do everything they can to protect Dawson. And have Dawson grow up the way he should be. And make sure Dawson's respectable. And make sure Dawson loves God. 
and make sure Dawson loves people. But they're going to dumb Dawson down. He's brilliant. But they're humans. And like all of us, they're sinners. And like all of us, they're going to fail. And Dawson's going to see that example and see how they react to those failures. And it's going to dumb Dawson down. It's a fact of life. Some of you look at me like I'm crazy, but it's, it's true. We're born brilliant. We're all born geniuses. It's the world around us that dumbs us up or dumbs us down. Dumbs us down, I guess, would be more appropriate. And Dawson, I need to apologize to you for your grandparents. They're going to be in the same boat, buddy. As much as I'm going to love you and protect you and be an awesome grandpa, I'm going to fail you too. And this church, Dawson, I'm going to apologize right now for this church. Because no matter how much this church loves you, how, no matter how much this whole church has prayed for you, for your safety and your health, this church is going to fail you at times. It's going to fail because we live in a sinful world. Not because we're bad people. Not because we want to fail, Dawson. We don't. None of us want to fail anybody. But because we live in a sinful world and failure is part of sin. In reality, we all, and just like our opening hymn said, we are all children of God. We're not adults of God. We're children of God. And we need to become like Dawson's going to be. Completely trusting. How many remember your childhood or your kids and you're walking with them and they're holding your hand and they just go to jump off of something they probably shouldn't be jumping off of? Because they know daddy's going to catch them. They just know. They don't question it. Right? They're sitting on the edge of a pool. They can't swim. Dad says, hey, come on, jump. And they jump. Freely, trustingly, because they know daddy's not ever going to let him get hurt. He's not going to do anything to cause him pain. And that's how we need to become. Dawson's going to love fearlessly. He's not going to be afraid to love until we teach him to be afraid of loving. Right? He's going to love fearlessly. He's going to love everybody. He's not going to care who you are, where you come from. What you do in life, it's his nature as a child to just love. He doesn't know any different until we teach it to him. That's what God wants from us. So today, we're going to cover some scriptures, and I'm actually going to read it from a Bible today. Usually I have my electronic version up here. But I'm reading it from a version I think fits what we're talking about better than anything, because... The premise of this ser sermon is children and becoming childlike again. And it's a simple message. Therefore, I believe our text need to be read in a simple form. So let's go back to our scripture reading. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 3. One day when they were sitting in the marketplace, the disciples were discussing what determines a person's greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Apparently they were already sure they were going, right? They wanted to know who's going to be the best, who's going to be the greatest. They asked Jesus about it. He called the mother with a small child over to him, tenderly taking the little one in his arms. See, I want you to focus on every word of these text, tenderly taking the child in his arms. Not grabbing him and plopping him down. Tenderly. Tenderly. That's how he wants to treat us. Tenderly. Gently. Softly. Lovingly. He said, unless you change and become as trusting and harmless as this little child, you could not even be admitted into God's kingdom much less be considered great. Such innocence comes to adults only by choice. The person who humbles himself like this child is great in the sight of heaven. Are we there? 
Are we anywhere close there? Be honest with yourself. Are you anywhere close to there? None of us trust without question. We trust and go, well, I hope this works out, right? A child just trusts. Dad's catching me. Mom is going to correct me. They're not going to let me get myself in trouble, right? Now, some churches have taken, it's a certain sect of church, it's a small church, has taken this literally. And in their church, they advocate coming in diapers, crawling around on the floor, crying like babies, and other disgusting things they do in their church, because they think that's what this says. They take this to the literal meaning. And that's not what Jesus means at all. He's talking about our hearts and our minds, going back to the innocence of our childhood. So how much does Jesus really love children? And remember, in children, I'm talking about us, Don. Me and you are kind of kid like anyway, so I don't think we ever grew up. But what he's talking about is our faith. So let's look up a few a few verses this morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremy 1, verse 5, and all of these texts you have heard many times. We quote them many times. So Jeremiah 1, verse 5. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I selected you. Before you were even formed in the womb. When you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, Jesus already knew you. He knew all about you. He knew what you were going to be like, Wes. He knew your character. He knew your capacity to love. He knew you would be a very generous person. He knows that. He knew it already. He knew it before we were even formed. Because he wants to have that special bond with us. He loves us so much. He knows all of us before we're even formed in the womb. Let's stay in the Old Testament and turn a few books up to Psalms. Psalms 139, verse 13 to 16. You shaped me before I was born. You put my bones together while I was still in my mother's womb. I praise you for this body is incredibly and wonderfully made. Your whole creation is amazing. When I was developing in my mother's womb, you knew everything that took place. To you, nothing is hidden or mysterious. You saw my unformed body inside the womb. You knew how long I would live before I was even born. You know, we've spent many sleepless and prayerful nights over Dawson. This church has prayed a lot for Dawson because there were some concerns that Dawson may not make it till now. Jesus said, don't worry about it. I got this. It's part of my plan. Quit worrying so much. Pray for him, yes, but I've got this. I've already had a plan for Dawson. And whatever that plan is, it's between me and Dawson. Jesus loves us so much, he already knows all about us. Go back to the New Testament, let's turn to Mark. Mark chapter 10. Verse 13 to 16. Soon a group of mothers were crowding around, trying to bring their children to Jesus for a blessing. His disciples told them to go away. Don't bother Jesus. He's busy. When Jesus saw what they were doing, he was very displeased. Oh, you mean Jesus could get a little disappointed in his disciples? He could get a little displeased? 
not just with money changers in the sanctuary, right? He got a little displeased with his disciples, shooing those children away. Jesus said, don't stop these mothers. Let these little ones come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to those with childlike faith. In fact, unless people are as trusting as these little children, they cannot possibly have part in God's kingdom. Then Jesus reached down and picked up one little toddler after another and blessed every one of them. Every one. You know, what I think about when I see Jesus doing this to every one of these children, picking each one up, first of all, the love he had for each one of these kids. He probably had a little story he whispered in their ear, a little something to make them giggle. You know, Jesus understood them. But Jesus sat there, and I remember, I'm a big Arizona Cardinal football fan. I know, horrible last few years for him. Last few centuries for him. Um, <laughs> but these last couple of years have been really bad. But they used to have their summer camp up in Flagstaff. And I used to take my kids there every year, Abigail, when she was just a little tiny, and Tyler and Amanda. And I remember I used to watch Kurt Warner and Larry Fitzgerald, probably two of the greatest Cardinal players they've had in forever. Both really good community guys, both good Christian people. And at lunchtime, when the team would go in to eat, those two would come down the line of the people watching the games. And they would stay there and give up their lunch break to sign an autograph for every person in that line. Every day. They'd get pictures taken with them. They were there for the people because they understood that their success was through these people. And these people loved them and they didn't want to disappoint them and they wanted to give this love back. That's how I imagine it is with Jesus with all these children. It wouldn't have mattered that that line was three miles long. He would have picked up each one of those kids, made sure each one of those kids knew how much he loved them, sent each kid off with a smile on their face, and he would have stayed there for days if he needed to. That's how much Jesus loves the children. Now let's go back to Matthew 18. And we're going to go to verse 6. And this is what I call the grandpa clause, okay? Verse 6 said this, Whoever welcomes a little child in my name welcomes me. But anyone who causes even one of these to lose their faith, anyone who harms one of these children of mine, it would be better off to have a large stone tied around his neck and be thrown into the sea. In Grandpa Todd terminology, when Dawson comes and anybody hurts Dawson, first of all, you better hope that Jaden doesn't get to you first. But if anybody hurts Dawson, if anybody turns Dawson away from God when we're trying so hard to keep him here in the church, if anybody pulls him away, they better call 911 and get the police rolling to him before Grandpa shows up. I had 10 years in investigations. I investigated more homicides than any other officer in the city of Cottonwood. I know where people made their mistakes and got caught. I'll just leave it at that. That's funny. You can laugh. It's a joke. But I also have a backhoe and a big backyard. And nobody will ever find your body. <laughs> Basically, that's what God is telling you about the children. If you harm one of his children, you're going to be better off having a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the sea versus what's going to happen to you when he comes again. Think about that. Don't you want to be one of his children? Don't you want that on your side? Nobody's going to hurt you, Wes. Because if they do, Papa's coming. And he'll take care of it for you. Don't you worry about it. That's the kind of God I want to serve. For me, it's important with my line of work that my guy's got my back. <laughs> Who better to have your back? Right? Somebody that knows everything and everybody and every thought that goes on. Jesus loves the children. We are his children. 
He loves us. Jesus loves the babies and the children so much because it's what He wants from us. That childlike faith, that complete trust in Him, not the questionable trust that we all do, right? If we had the trust Jesus wants, we'd move mountains, right? The faith of a mustard seed. We don't even have that because we're not moving mountains. If we had that, if we had what Jesus asked to have, and we went back to that childlike faith, that childlike love, that childlike trust, we couldn't build the church big enough in Cottonwood to house all the people that would be coming to this church. We need to start with ourselves. It's great to have evangelistic meetings, Jack. But if we don't have that childlike faith, if we don't have that childlike love, if we don't have that, we're never going to fill the church. We have to have that kind of faith. That's what Jesus asks of us. That pure innocence. That pure, wonderful demeanor. You see, Jesus was not only sent to be our Savior, although that was the most important thing He came here for. He came here to set the example for us of how to achieve heaven. And that example doesn't go through His adulthood. That example goes from Jesus' childhood forward. So I don't like to read when I'm doing sermons. But Desire of Ages says an awful lot about Jesus' childhood. And I've got to read it because I don't want to miss anything. There's some stuff I, I've not put in here. But there's a lot that I have. Just so we understand what Jesus was like as a child. He wants us to follow Him. He wants us to be like Him. Follow His footsteps. Become like a child. Let's find out what that child was like. Wonderful in its significance is the brief record of his early life. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In the sunlight of his father's countenance, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's from Luke 2.52. His mind was active and penetrating with the thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character the one thing we get to take to heaven with us. His character was beautiful in its symmetry. The powers of his mind and body developed gradually in keeping with the laws of childhood. So he grew just like we grow. He grew at the same rate we did. He didn't have any miraculous, I'll get that out, miraculous thing where all of a sudden he was an adult, right? Healing people and sharing with people. He had an entire childhood to grow. As a child, Jesus manifested a, pe a peculiar loveliness of disposition. <laughs> How many of you have a loveliness of disposition? If you raise your hand, I'm going to call you a liar, because you are. Some of us try to be lovely, but some of us aren't. I know for me, after 19 years in law enforcement, a lot of my lovely disposition has gone away. That's something I need to work on bringing back. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. Ready hands, always willing to serve others. Here's where I'm going to do a plug right now for the nominating committee. They've just started this past week selecting people to serve in our church. If we're going to be childlike and follow Jesus' example, we need to be willing to to serve others. So when you get that phone call, no matter how much you don't want to do that job again, or you don't want to be asked to do the new position somebody, an entire board, thinks you'd be really good at, don't say no. Give it a shot. Give it a try. Do your best. It's tough to find people to fill positions in our church. But every position is so important. And Jesus said, follow me, follow my footsteps. 
You want to be in heaven? You want to be ready to go to heaven? We need to start having different attitudes with the way we do things. We need to start getting our tactical diaper bag ready. Our tactical Jesus bag. I'm going to start something. I'm going to start a tactical Jesus bag. I think that would be awesome. We fill with all the good stuff we need to be ready. He manifested patience. Ooh, we got to have patience too. Dennis, I'm not patient. I want things done now. I want Hudson, or Hudson, I get it mixed up all the time. That's my other grandson. I want Dawson to come now. I don't want to wait three more weeks. I know Jaden wants Dawson yesterday. He's tired of waiting. It's been a long time, Dawson. Turn around and come on out, buddy. Quit harassing your mother. Come harass the rest of us. Patience. We don't have it. We don't like it. Patience is not a virtue most of us have, but it's something we need to. He manifested patience that nothing could disturb and the truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. Not just courtesy, unselfish. What does that mean? Being courteous for no other reason than to be nice. Be nice. Be courteous. Open a door. Don't expect a thank you. Just open the door for people. Help people out. You don't get a thank you? It's okay. I'm not doing it for me. I'm not doing it for praises for me. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. Being nice is good. I see because I'm reading I lose my place. Ellen White goes on to talk about Jesus schooling. And Jesus went to school in the synagogue schools, the rabbi schools, because there were some issues with that. Same issues we're finding in our schools today. They had certain agendas they wanted filled. They had certain things they wanted taught. Certain things that didn't have anything to do with getting to heaven. Now, some of that stuff is needed. Math, although I hate it. Learning how to speak correctly and write correctly. Learning your history, very important. What's the other extracurricular stuff they added in that wasn't needed? See, Jesus was raised at home. Now, I'm not saying we need to be homeschooled, but the example I want to use is we still educate ourselves today, even as adults. I don't care what your age is. You're still educating your stuff by the things you read, by the things you see on going on Snapface or Book Chat or whatever those things are. I see some people find it funny. We learn by reading things on the internet that are probably not true. Right? There's one truth we need to learn from. There's one thing all of us desperately need to do more study of, and that's right here. Without this, we don't gain that knowledge that Jesus had. We don't know how to walk with Him. We don't know how to fully trust Him. So you can become childlike in your faith, but without this, you're never going to get there. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. As we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through His Word, not through the Internet, angels will draw near, our minds will be strengthened, our characters will be elevated and, re and refined. We should become more like our Savior. And as we behold the beautiful and grand nature, affections go out after, the grand in nature, affections go out to God. Just like I spoke of at the beginning. Getting out in nature and seeing the spring and the new life and the babies and all that stuff, it brings you back to God. It makes you respect God for what He's done. It makes you look at His creation and go, wow, God is really something. Man can't create this. Man can't recreate this. Man doesn't even know how this happened. Many men think things just blew up and turned out this way. How silly is that? When you go out and see nature and study nature and be nature and be part of nature 
and see the birds and see the baby animals and see baby Dawson coming into this world with 11 fingers and 10 toes. He doesn't. He has 10 of each. We've counted twice. That's when you become in awe of God. While the spirit is awed, the soul is invigorated by coming in contact with the infinite through his works. The life of Jesus was life in harmony with God. While he was a child, he thought and spoke as a child. But no trace of sin marred the image of God within him. Yet he was not exempt from temptation. The inhabitants of Nazareth were proverbial for their wickedness. The low estimate in which they were generally held is shown by Nathaniel's question in John 1.46. Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? What a horrible place. Nothing good could come out of there. Jesus was placed where his character would be tested. It was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity. He was subject to all the conflicts which we have to meet. That he might be an example to us in childhood. In what? In adulthood? An example to us in his childhood. His youth and his manhood. His entire life. We need to be more on guard, don't we? Now, we're not going to be pure like Jesus. We're going to make mistakes. That's why we apologized to Dawson at the beginning. We're going to make mistakes. And we're going to fail. But we need to be on guard as Jesus was part of the time. All the time. We need to be on guard all the time. We need to be careful what we're putting in our minds, what we're watching on television, what we're reading on the internet, who we're talking to, who we're talking about. Yeah. We need to be careful of those things. We need to be on guard all the time. As Jesus worked in childhood and youth, mind and body were developed. He did not use his physical powers recklessly, but in such a way to keep them in health that he might do the best work in every line. Uh-oh. Do we do our best work in every line of work we do? Sometimes we get a little lazy. Sometimes we get a little slack. Sometimes we say that can wait till tomorrow. I guarantee Wes would love to have every one of his employees that worked 110% all day long to the very end of the day and did it to such perfection he never got a call from a customer saying, hey, you need to get you guys back out here. This is wrong. We need to be perfect and hardworking in everything we do. That includes when we take these positions, the nominating committee is going to call us about. First of all, we're going to say yes. Because that's the example Jesus set for us. Say yes and be willing. And number two, when you do that job, you do it to the best of your ability and to perfection every time. Now, I can say I'm naturally a good speaker. I always have been. And that's true. I'm very natural up here. I always have been. Sometimes I was a kid. I always loved speech classes. I always loved debates. I, it's natural for me. But I can tell you, every time it's time for me to do a sermon, I struggle. Not because the speaking's hard. That part comes easy. It's because of the message. I've got to give 110% to make sure I'm listening to God and what He wants me to say. These sermons are not from me. I'm just the tool. But in that tool, I need to make sure I'm 110% on board with what God wants. And I'm giving 110% and I'm doing it to the perfection that He has asked me to do. That's why when I'm worried that i got 45 minutes and a 30-minute sermon, I'm already at 45 minutes and it's time to go home. And I've still got more to cover. Because Jesus wants me to keep talking and keep getting the message. Jesus was the fountain of healing and mercy for the world. And through all those secluded years at Nazareth, his life flowed out in currents of sympathy and tenderness. We're pretty sympathetic as a church. And we're pretty tender. But there's times we can be calloused. There's times things happen that we get offended by personally. 
I do. As far as our elders go, I'm probably the most calloused one we have as an elder. It's not always a bad thing. But not when I'm dealing as an elder. <laughs> I need to learn to be a little more tender and a little less callous sometimes. I get that. I acknowledge that. I struggle with that. I work with that. I will win the battle over that before Jesus comes again. Because I want to make sure I'm in heaven. The age, the sorrowing, the sin burden, the children at play in their innocent joy. Again, there's that innocent word. The little creatures of the groves, the patient beasts of burden, all were happier for Jesus' presence. Are people happier when you walk into the room? Because of your personality, because of the way you carry yourself, because of your honesty, because of your integrity, are people happy when you walk into the room? Or do they look at you and go, I'm not sticking around here if this is who's here. If that's the case, there's a problem. We should walk into this church and just love being here with everybody that's in here. We're all brothers and sisters, right? He whose word of power upheld the worlds, just speaking, Jesus upholds the worlds. He's so powerful. As a child, he would stoop to retrieve or to relieve a wounded bird. Do you have that gentleness in you? Do you have that softness in you? You're not even close to being, we're not, I'll put me, we, not you. We are not even close to having the kind of power that Jesus has. And yet, do we walk by even a wounded bird and not help it? Or are we so loving and tender that we stop and help all that need our help? That's what Jesus wants from us. It's a tough assignment. We don't want to do that. We're selfish individuals. Every one of us. We have some selfishness to it. Jesus asks us to let that go. Let that go. Be willing to be there for your fellow man. There was nothing beneath his notice, nothing to which he disdained to minister. Jesus is our example. There are many who dwell with interest upon the period of his public ministry while they pass unnoticed the teaching of his early years. But it is in his home life that he is a pattern for all children and youth. Us, now, as adults, we're still his children. The Savior condescended to poverty that he might teach how closely we in a humble lot may walk with God. He lived to please, honor, and glorify his Father in the common things of life, even in his work. His work began in consecrating to the lowly trade of the craftsmen who toiled for their daily bread. He was doing God's service just as much when laboring at the carpenter's bench as when working miracles for the multitude. And every youth who follows Christ's example of faithfulness and obedience in his lowly home may claim those words spoken of him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. So what about us? Are you willing today to be childlike? Childlike in heart and in mind and in spirit? Follow the example that Jesus gave us to follow? The example that he says, only if you become like this again, will you be in heaven? If you don't do this, you're not even going to make it. Forget about your ranking in heaven. You're not even going to be knocking on the door unless you become like these children. Jesus wants us to come before him with our innocence and childlike faith, showing him that we trust Jesus with every aspect of our lives. We prayed for Dawson. We had to trust that God was going to take care of things. Although it was scary sometimes, not knowing what was going to happen, what was going to be the next step. God had it under control. 
It's okay. We're still looking for a new pastor. The right one hasn't come along yet. God knows who we need. We have to have patience. As much as we don't like the patience sometimes, Dennis. <laughs> we wanted the pastor months ago. But has it been all that bad? You get your elders up here more often, and we have a great group of elders. I think every one of them does fantastic with sermons and speaking. You don't get that in every church. We're very blessed here. So God went, because of that, guys, I'm going to teach you guys, you elders, I'm going to teach you guys some patience. I'm going to teach this church some patience. But I'm going to help build those elders up a little bit more. I'm going to give them a little bit more responsibility to do so they can start building a better faith and relationship with me. It makes the church stronger. And it gives me, as God, more time to find you that perfect person to come in and lead your church. That's the kind of person he wants us to be. So are we today going to be as the children, longing to come to Jesus and sit on his knee while we let our little light shine? Unafraid to share our love for our Father to the world around us? Not worrying about what people are going to say. Who cares? My grandkids, when they see me, the ones in Texas, and I'm sure it'll be the same with Dawson, and they haven't seen me for a while, they run to me. They don't care where they're at or who's around. They love run to me and to Mimi and grab us. Pappy and Mimi, or they call me happy. They call me pappy, but they have trouble with the peace. They call me happy. Happy and Mimi, happy and Mimi. They hug us and they love us and they cherish being with us. They don't care who sees. They don't care who's around. We need to be that way with Jesus. I don't care. You ask me if I'm a Christian? Yes. You don't ask if I'm a Christian. Hey, Jesus loves you, man. Right? We need to be willing to share that. This is what Jesus is asking of us today. And I know for me, personally, to be an example to Dawson, that kid, that I want to make sure I never fail. I want to make sure I'm doing what Jesus asked me so that Dawson can learn to love Jesus the way he's supposed to. I'm going to try my best to become what my Savior asked me to be. And let my little light shine for everybody to see. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Dear Jesus, thank you for letting us learn more about what you want from us. How you want us to be childlike in every way with our faith, with our love, with our innocence, with our selflessness. Amen. Help us each one, Father, to go out of here. Let our light shine bigger and brighter than we ever have before. We know with what's going on in the world around us, Father, that your coming back is going to be really soon. And we need to let this light shine bigger and brighter than ever before. Thank you, Father, for giving us the opportunity to shine for you. We pray in your name. Amen.